So this is a, um, a free form, uh, just final 20, 25 minute um, discussion with our four panelists and really just um, two, sets of, uh, two sets of questions and observations and if any of you then have any final thoughts or observations to them, um, please do ask them. Maybe um, Abelia, if I can start with you, just really what have you learned from this morning uh, from the report and and from the discussions and what do you take on and, and most importantly where do we, where do we all go from here I think I'll start with w can you hear me yeah. yeah I think I'll start with where we go from here because I think so as someone so at Yahoo this is my job is very much centered on what we do to protect our users rights to freedom of expression and privacy so this is what I do every day and I think sometimes what what frustrates me is that a lot of the conversations about this issue dance around the central problem and I think that unless we really look at some of the hard problems, we're not going to come to any specific and practical solutions. So specifically, and it's been alluded to um, before, um, I'll start with a couple of things. One, as a company, uh, first of all, I, if you, the IC tech, see, ICT sector is very large. And if you talk about what the motivations for companies are or what the levers are for companies, it's different for different companies. So if you're looking at a company like Google or Yahoo, where your whole business model is centered on the freedom of expression and free, freedom, the free flow of information, you see that there's a very much an alignment between between what we do as a business. If some people were asking, well, what are the, what's the carrot? There's a very strong alignment between what we do as a business and, free, and, and the ideals of GNI. So if you take that as a given and you think about what, um, the, what the problem is, so we are actually dealing with, and I think we dance around this a little bit too much. So yes, a company like ours can do human rights impact assessments. Yes, a company like ours can try and organize our, our um, our operations in, in terms of jurisdiction and try and avoid um, repressive regimes, but when it comes down to it, if a company is subject to a particular law, that company is bound to obey that law. And I think solutions need to address that. Solutions can't pretend that um, it's collusion. Now, of course, there are some cases, depending on what sector you're in, where there's an issue of collusion, but when you're talking about this particular issue, that's not what you're talking about. So what I'm really looking forward to, and what I think a multi-stakeholder uh, organization like GNI is best at is figuring out what specifically should companies do. Yes, you should do human rights and back assessment, but when you're faced with it, when you're faced with that particular law, what is the specific solution for companies? And that's what I hope that organizations like GNI and 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 and, 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 con and, and events like this will do and will focus on specific solutions for companies that are actually interested in doing the right thing. Thank you, uh, Rebecca. And, and uh, that that point, what companies do. To uh, how, if you can t maybe talk a little bit to the report or anything um, that has been discussed today as, as a framework for for, progr for progressing just that point. Uh, right, I thought I was later in the agenda, but uh, <laughs> I'm still working on what I was going to say. No, um, but but uh, to to pick up on some things that that have been said, um, that also deal with this kind of forward looking question where we go and, and, and sort of what do we need to be doing more of. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things that, that came up in the last session um, was just how important it is to get the activists on the ground, the people who are affected through the use of the technology, communicating directly with the companies. And how do we facilitate more of that in a way that, you know, obviously companies have to do their work. They can't spend all their time meeting with human rights activists from every single country on earth. But, you know, how, how do we get more communication uh, between people who are using technology whose rights and whose relationship with government is being affected and mediated through the use of that technology how, how do you get more discussion feedback? Um, how, do you, how do you ensure that, that people in the companies, um, both in headquarters and in, in different parts of the company, really understand um, how things play out? Um, because they're not hired based on their ability to understand how their technology plays out for users in Syria or something. But you know, how, how do we kind of get that communication going? Uh, what role can the NGOs in um, GNI play in facilitating that dialogue um, to a greater degree. How can we be helpful um, also, or what kind of mechanisms do we need to enable companies to digest and absorb the information and concerns of how things are playing out all over the world in a way that can then be operational? 
Um, and and I, I think there's a, there's a lot of very specific things we can be thinking about. Um, on a very practical note, and this has come up in our internal discussions yesterday and at other times, is, is how do we just diversify the number of NGOs that are involved with GNI from around the world and also in make sure that they are participating actively, you know, that we have mechanisms for them to participate actively and bring, you know, concerns from the communities where they work in and, and, and bring that to the companies. So I, I think there's a lot of work that can be done and it doesn't all have to be done by GNI itself, but by civil society organizations more broadly, um, uh, kind of interfacing with GNI in, in different ways. Um, so I think that I'd be very interested in hearing what people here in the room today think um, about uh, ways in, in which these kinds of, of uh, th this, this kind of information sharing and communication could be better facilitated because that struck me as one of the more powerful um, things that, that's going on. Um, and uh, I'm sure Abella has more to say about that. But, um, and then one other point, again, just to sort of pick up on um, what I've been hearing is the, the gentleman uh, who's not here anymore um, uh, from the engineering community who was yeah. behind uh, uh, developing uh, what went on to be TOR, um, I think he, he made a point that I hear quite a bit from the technical community, which is, and the, the technical community is, I think he's right, it's not well represented within GNI, that the technical expertise within GNI is really all coming from companies. And I think there's an interesting question whether we should mm -hmm. have sort of people, independent engineers and, and developers, members of the developer community that are not affiliated with specific companies in, involved with GNI in some way as well. Uh, but this whole question, you know, you could actually, engineers point out, you could have a much more secure, um, a router than you do, uh, but uh, then law enforcement uh, would, would you know, I mean, things are engineered in a certain way because of both law enforcement demands and, and because companies want to retain data for commercial reasons. They don't, companies, you know, from, from a complete human rights standpoint, of course, you wouldn't retain, you'd retain extremely minimal data and you'd, you'd secure all communications so that there'd be nothing to capture. Um, but we're not doing that, both for commercial and law enforcement reasons. And there are, I think, some really interesting technical questions that we've not explored about do we need to be thinking outside the box technically also a little bit more. Um, so, so kind of throwing out those two um, big ideas um, for, for brainstorming um, in, in terms of kind of where I see, you know, just answering this question of where do we go from here and what are some of the tough questions, those, those seem to, to be two, and you know, one sure. could go on. Uh, Leslie. So I'm not sure I agree with Rebecca, because I think the problem with a new organization is that everybody pours a variety of visions into it, and it starts to very quickly move beyond a core mission. <coughs> and I think that we're really at the cusp of being able to move forward our core mission and our and you know it, i think the first thing we ought to do um is say what we've done there's there's i think an enormous focus on well if you don't have more companies you know what have you done and i so i think it's really important to stop and acknowledge that six years ago when we all first met and some of us had the sullivan principles and the people who had been involved in the labor had a different um, the perception of what the problem was was extremely narrow. Um, it was Yahoo in China. Uh, the attention of companies to this issue uh, was really minimal. Um, and the global discussion about how companies should behave didn't exist. I think GNI had, should own what it has done to change that, you know, before we take another step forward um, there are you know companies may not be in the room um, but they're all undergoing uh, assessments and developing principles and looking at how they behave um, 
it, it simply would not have happened without G&I. And I. And, you know, it, it, it amuses me sometimes to, to hear the very companies who won't G, join G&I for a variety of reasons are at the same time pretty aggressively taking the practices of G&I and the policies and trying to figure out how it applies. So one, we need to own it and we need to own what our impact has been. Um, I think we're only beginning to, to do uh, what I've always believed is the critical part of G&I and that's to, to figure out how we focus on collaborative learning and take the results of that learning and turn it into products that are useful for companies and advocates who we will never meet. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'd like to see us start with transparency and start with how do we start to describe from the information the companies have and perhaps other companies uh, in a way that doesn't necessarily say Yahoo is experiencing this and Google is experiencing that and Microsoft is experiencing something else. How do we start to be able to put out information that really gets people to understand what is it companies are being asked to do? We, we do a lot of description of what the laws are um, that govern and I think we can all agree that the laws are getting worse everywhere and implicating broader sectors. Um, but I'd really like to see, and it, you know, it does move you know, in part from the Google Transparency Report, but really start to be able to get a better handle on for, for the people in those countries, what are, what are we being asked to do and under what circumstances? And, and how often do those demands, you know, comport with the laws that have, have been passed. So I would like to see us do that. I would like to ha see us do more events that lead to things like our um, report on, uh, on, on, on uh, uh, takedowns in social media uh, and the impact on human rights and best practices to start to, I feel if we're gonna see the global standard, we have to start getting very operational about what it means. So in some ways, I think I'm saying the same thing that, that you did. and. Um, I think we can do that with companies that are in GNI and companies that are not, um, to, and and create those products. Um, I'd love to be able to figure out how you create those products with the kind of outreach to companies that we don't normally reach and may never reach to 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 have those have that subject matter and do the outreach around the world in small private meetings that allow us to really understand the on the ground situation in a way that it's very hard even for big western companies to know who have a different set of resources and lawyers um, to bring to bear. So I think the hard work, you know, we've spent a lot of our early days on uh, the accountability of our own companies who are involved. It's critically important. I think I'm starting to see a light at the end of the tunnel of, of sort of putting that together. Um, but. Um, both in terms of bringing the GNI message globally, we ha we've only begun to do that. I mean, and, and that message, I mean, you know, our goal to seed the global standard really needs to become global and it needs to be carried by civil society and investors and others um, who are not in this room. Um, and then we need to start actually putting some practical um, best practices and experiences on the table for people to understand. Thank you. Um, we're running uh, quite short of time, Bennett, as you've made a couple of contributions to the floor, just very, if in a couple of sentences. Um, Give me just two, two minutes. I want to actually okay. bridge a point that Rebecca made in Leslie's and uh, Rebecca's first point in Leslie's uh, semi-dissent. Look, <laughs> uh, you know, I love thinking and talking about the structure and mechanics of GNI, but I'm going to get big picture here for just a minute or two. Um, while there is nothing more important, in my opinion, than for GNI to do now and for the long term, than to have its company members, and I hope ever expanding number of company members, demonstrate their implementation of the GNI principles. There is a larger mission, vision, and potential goal within reach here. And it goes back to a point that Dan Baer made a couple of hours ago uh, about 
uh, the focus for GNI for similar efforts uh, in the ICT sector and broader efforts in other sectors around business and human rights are almost always motivated by trying to address risk, risk to reputation in particular, social license to operate. And I think that that is largely true. Um, certainly my experience with extractives, footwear and apparel, and a number of other sectors. But I do think that there is a distinct, if not unique, opportunity in this industry around these issues to posit a positive outcome that will enhance the brands of companies identified with an initiative like GNI, but more importantly, enlarge the scope of freedom, way beyond just addressing risks and maintaining social license and to operate. Now, look, I have absolutely no illusion, and I'm going to be very direct about this. I know why GNI came together, why those <coughs> uh, conversations that Leslie played such an instrumental role in convening six years and a couple months ago now. You know, when you had Yahoo, Google, Microsoft, Cisco, eviscerated by the late, great Tom Lantos uh, in February of 2006, this was about brand management. But I think brand risk, social license to operate, and it's still largely about that. But if we can connect to the freedom agenda here uh, in ways and, and connect with activists around the world in ways that Rebecca alluded to and in her own work beyond uh, GNI is doing so much through Global Voices and other channels as are others in the room trying to, then I think we're on to something. And, you know, take a look at Yahoo's business and human rights program that Bele runs and the Women in Diversity Conference you convened a month ago. The Liberty and Internet Conference that Google had here in town, what, two or three weeks ago. The efforts that Google makes to support uh, politically and funding-wise, uh, internet freedom activists, users around the world, I think that there's a, just an extraordinary opportunity here for these and other companies, I hope, to come to stand up for privacy, for expression, and I want to, in my day job as an investor, I hope other investors will join us, the NGO community, and most important, millions and millions of users around the world recognize and reward companies trying to do the right thing. It's not just about compliance and implementation. It's about protecting and, and, and respecting and ultimately enlarging in the internet era a 21st century of transparency and accountability, I hope, the scope of freedom. Thank you. Um, we've got time for f five minutes or so of observations, challenges, questions, and, and most importantly, I would say suggestions um, from the floor about the where do we go from here. And I would say, let's keep it, let's keep it blue, um, sort of big picture, where do we go from here on, on the big, big issues that, that GNI addresses. Who would like to uh, contribute some thoughts? Sorry, yeah. Yeah, okay. No, it's on, it's on, it's on. Hold, hold it closer. So um, I, I, I agree with uh, both Rebecca and Leslie. And Derek is really both of you. But, um, but I agree, Leslie, we need to own, we as GNI need to own where we have come. So we've done that all day and we've been doing that. So I think we can now move on. We, we've accomplished some things. So I think in this room. I think in this room. We can move. Um, but I do think looking ahead, there was a fair amount of discussion earlier in the past five, six years that, um, that we had different views within GNI of uh, how to strategically choose our opportunities in terms of developing. And I think what has prevailed is, uh, was a prevailing view that we not take on the hard cases, plural. And um, so I think one thing we need to start thinking about as a first an internal conversation is, you know, how, how do we want to think about the implementation of the GNI or how do we think about outreach, but all of the different <coughs> activities, you know, in a, in a difficult uh, uh, country. And difficult not meaning Pakistan or India or Iran. I mean difficult meaning 
a difficult country coupled with huge business market opportunity. And that, that's what makes it difficult, I think. Um, no, we don't use the word China. We say <laughs> North Asia, or we say, you know, something like that. But, but I, I, I think that's part of the, you know, sort of the, the I half joke. So, um, so one thing I think we need to think about is two suggestions going forward. Um, we need to figure out a way to leverage the, the really um, substantive experience and the strategic experience and the advocacy experience of the NGOs, both within GNI and, and not within GNI. I think the, GN, the NGO community, we need to think the constituency within GNI how to do better and more strategic thinking about our outreach so we can build the NGO constituency to have, you know, bring, you know, greater diversity um, to GNI. The second thing is, I th um, uh, the gentleman who left um, on the question about technologists is that we also have to keep in mind that NGOs like, like, like mine, we've been working for 23 years with technologists as partners. And so we have that experience of working with technologists. And frankly, in our view, the solutions are never just technology. The solutions, because the problem of freedom of expression and advancing and protecting these rights is not a technical problem. You know, it's a legal, political, social, cultural, you know, and technical problem. And so the solution requires all of us to think about it as all the pieces. So I, I, I agree that we need to bring in more of the technologists that are not affiliated with business or companies. But I also think we have to recognize that many of us have been working with and talking to technologists and hacker community, et cetera, and actually who are very helpful to our work. Um, and then the, 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 the other thing I wanted to add is on the business case, is um, I thought Mike did a terrific job of like articulating the business case. And I want to just add two things to that, because that's where we go. It is very important to have business leaders and CFOs stand up and say what he said, not NGOs, because we're like talking to the converted or something. It's really, and so in answer to John, your question, you know, but why doesn't business think about that? I, w I was saying, well, look at what business has wrought. It's not like business community always makes the most reasonable decisions, and it's not like they make decisions that are in their own best interests. You know, uh, you know, exhibit A, look at the financial crisis we are now in in the world. The business community will not always make you know, decisions that are in the best interest of anybody. So I think that's one thing to keep okay. in mind. The second thing is users, the users, the market. When Google decided to move its server to Hong Kong, the one country to system solution, it got a big bump in the Chinese internet users community, which, was, which should be recognized. And that when you talk about a market that's going from 100 million to 500 million, to, you know, which is what it is, that's their future customers. And they thought, good for Google. <laughs> so right. I think we have to think about that too. Thank you. Um, we've got a, a few questions, as ever, people are shy coming forward, now they're all coming forward. And we're, 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 literally, um, we're literally running out of time, and there's one, there's one good Twitter question, which I, I was hoping somebody would ask. Um, does GNI fully embrace a multi-stakeholder model if it does not have member states as its own um, uh, members? In other words, the role of government. Um, on that. Um, right, we've got, th let's just, have th uh, we'll try and fit in as many. Really, really, please can I urge when people say I've just got one thing to say and then sort of um, 18 points later. Can you really, really keep it to one point, please? Um, uh, okay, uh, the two guys there um, next to each other. Yep. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so Dunstan, Alison Hope from BSR, and I had something to do with the founding of the GNI a while ago. Um, but I'm spending a lot of time advising companies who are not members of the GNI. And one thing I'd say is I wouldn't underestimate how influential the principles and implementation guidelines are because they're actually being used and applied by companies that are not in the GNI. And this is my key point. We've mentioned the telecoms companies and the documents that they've been circulating. One of the things that I would really like to see is even if there is separate organizations pursuing their own avenues, that there's much more continuity between what the principles actually say. Because I've seen in other initiatives, other sectors, competing codes of conduct, competing principles, and that's a very dangerous road to go down. And so even if we are going to see these other initiatives, I would love to see greater continuity in language. Great. Thank you. Next to you. Vivek Krishnamurthy from Foley Hoag. Since I'm sitting next to Dunstan, I have a very similar comment, which is that we've seen how influential the GNI principles are 
in companies that don't appear to be technology companies. Um, financial institutions, other kinds of companies that deal with large volumes of data crossing borders. They've taken the lessons of the GNI to heart and are seeking advice to do it. So they don't fit into the, the mold, but the, the precedent is there. Thank you. Uh, behind you and then uh, here and then I think we'll close. I have a simple question. If you're a user, you don't work in the internet space, you're an internet user, and you start to notice these issues and you want to get involved, what can GNI do for you and what can you do for GNI? That's a really good point, the, the interface with, with the users. Yeah, Danny, do you want to find a point uh, right here? So wait, 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 wait for the mic. Uh, so uh, I, I think I, I just like to follow up a, a slightly. So the, 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 the technologist who, um, who came and went was actually David Chaum. And uh, his un technologies underlie not only a lot of what financial systems use for digital cash, but a lot of the encryption systems that protect all of us. And so I think it's sort of significant when somebody like that get, wants to get involved and can't find a good way of doing it. But I think it also works vice versa, in that, that there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of expertise within GNI, and there are a lot of arenas that actually have quite a substantive power to um, influence how the net works, which are actually predominantly technology-led. And I'm thinking here in particular of international standard, technical standard organizations. And if GNI and the groups in GNI aren't there as a presence, I know for a fact that there are people looking at those, as, as tho at those venues as ways to sneak forth through surveillance yep. and restrictions on privacy. We're there, so, Yes, we're yes, there. you're, you're certainly, but, but wouldn't it be nice, but we're almost just, the only civil society. Right. So this and, is and the I, IETF, the International Engineering Task Force, and the W3C. And, yeah, and, um, and also sort of ISO standards, and, and you know, one of the ways that technology was profoundly affected um, in, the, in repressive countries was because the technical standards for lawful enforcement, mm -hmm. devised by very well-meaning people, um, in, in more stable democracies um, had no provision for technically restricting um, mass surveillance. And I think that's somewhere that GNI can, can represent themselves in a way that, that, that it makes sense commercially and also makes sense for, for um, uh, human rights uh, defenders. Thank you. I mean, there's some very interesting food for thought. We haven't even meant discussed the, the, the government question, uh, but obviously governments are. Bob, you wanted to have a quick quick word on government. Yeah, go on then, very quickly on that. And then I'd just like to ask people what little one-liners um, uh, to take away um, before uh, we ask German to speak. Seems to, seem, yeah, yeah. seems to me a fundamental conflict of interest to have government sitting in the room when you are trying to make decisions about how to deal with governments. Therefore, we don't have governments. And can That's I just add to that and right, really quickly? The other thing is that um, given who would join, the types of governments who would join, you would end up having, it would look like a, like a U.S.-led initiative against right. the rest of the world. Yeah. And that's not something that helps companies. It's not something that helps resolve the issue either. So it's a fair question, but I think that there are very real and valid reasons why that's okay. not the case. And also, if you could just quickly, uh, either of you, uh, you four, just very, very quickly address these, these questions of opening up, if that's the right w a term, for users and for technologists. Bennett, you go yeah, first. I'll just follow up also on government, yeah, having yeah, been yeah. like Bob, ex-government. Uh, Look, Bob's absolutely right. That said, GNI has been undertaking some advocacy with governments. We've developed a particularly rich set of relationships with European governments. We're beginning to move well beyond that. Our board chair, German Brooks, was just in Thailand a couple of weeks ago meeting with senior officials there. Uh, we're going to be doing even more of that in the coming months and couple of years. I could envision, since this is future oriented, some kind of structure or mechanism within several years. I wouldn't, I can't really foresee it before then, that would be a sort of GNI dialogue forum, but be way, be way beyond the frankly easy relationships we now have a tra in a transatlantic context. We need to engage some of these governments, and it's tough for individual companies to do so, but one of the key contributions that GNI 
can make is to serve as a platform for companies to come together with one or more governments on the same set of issues. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca, on, on users, do you want to say? Yeah, or? well, I, I mean, you know, I, I think we have some challenges in terms of how we how we interact with the world um, when we have a staff of two and 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 you know to what extent this is a, a more distributed approach rather <laughs> than a you know g and i does everything and and maybe it's you know here are the and here are the public facing non-governmental organizations that are members of g and i that you as an internet user can get involved with Right. Um, and, and also there's some interesting organizations that are cropping up, like there, there's a startup that's just about to launch in a week or so that's meant to be a mechanism for people to report on when their content gets deleted on various social networking platforms. Um, and so, so I think there's also a, an interesting question of what other types of organizations could help interface with GNI, um, rather than saying that you know, GNI as an institution right. has to manage yep. all of it. And Leslie, very briefly. Well, but, but having said that, GNI's own founding documents um, does include a commitment for an interaction. Uh, yeah. And it is something that we are you know, working on, both a question of to what extent we deal with complaints as GNI as compared to a distributed model, but also um, is there a way for people through our website and elsewhere to, to give comments? I think. For a small organization, the question is if, if, if you know, when you, when, you, when you operate in the internet and you're not talking about, will people report in from sweatshops, you're talking about what do you do if you get 100,000 people commenting and do they all expect to comment back? So there's a scale question given what we're doing that, uh, yes, requires sort of a, a distributed response, but we're also going to have to sort of test out to make sure we don't... Um, promise things we can't deliver. And Abele, just to raise our sights, give us the, uh, the, the single thing to take away um, in terms of the big challenge that, that Yahoo is now going to take away from this in this brave new nirvana we're about to uh, well, I, I tackle. I think I already said it. I think this is a very hard problem, and it lends itself to solutions that are very operational. I think, I think what, what keeps me up at night is that even if we do everything right, so if we do a human rights impact assessment, if we make sure that we've adjusted our, the jurisdiction so that it's in the right one, a government can still imprison someone unfairly. And I think that's, so that's the problem that me and I think all of our companies are trying to solve. And I think that's what the problem that GNI is, is trying to solve. And I think solving that problem requires multi-stakeholder engagement. And it also requires looking at a hard problem and figuring out operational solutions. Okay. Um, may I thank Rebecca, Bennett, Leslie, and Abela. I'm now going to uh, swap places with GNI's independent chair, German Brooks, to close uh, this morning's session. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. And I'd, I'd like to thank uh, uh, particularly our moderator, um, John Kampfer, who has done a tremendous job uh, keeping all of our uh, brilliant speakers uh, on uh, on topic uh, and uh, very interestingly so uh, I found it quite fascinating and uh, an another thing and I just a couple of reflections on on this uh, first forum uh, that GNI ha has ever held so congratulations to the organization congratulations to Susan and particularly uh, to David for having put this together David Sullivan um, but some, some reflections. So we call ourselves the Global Network Initiative. And there's a very important word there, global. And many of us feel that we're not really filling out that particular element uh, of our name very well. But I think what we were demonstrating uh, in, this, in this forum was our growing globalness. Uh, both our uh, speakers uh, who were uh, our three speakers, because we had um, um, uh, Marika Sharka as well uh, on her video uh, have shown uh, the, the growing international uh, membership and the growing international interest uh, in what we're doing. So I think that is a very important element which is coming together uh, from, from this forum. And I was asked, in fact, um, only about 10 days ago in the Netherlands, well, where will the next forum be? Uh, it may well be uh, in another part of the world uh, and again, demonstrating uh, the focus uh, that I think uh, GNI needs to have. Um, 
The, the second uh, point is um, I, I felt very proud uh, of being uh, part of GNI, uh, both because of the um, the speakers who are already members of GNI, particularly also the board members who spoke to us at last, but also those others who have contributed very greatly uh, to the uh, input in this forum, because the, the standard of the debate, uh, the intellectual caliber uh, of uh, the expertise which is coming uh, from those discussions is really quite extraordinary. Uh, there is no other organization which is able in our particular area to pull together uh, that level of expertise. And that leads me really to the fundamental issue which is that as we come together as a multi-stakeholder uh, group of experts around are major issues of how do we prevent illegitimate censorship and surveillance of uh, the, the users of the internet? How do, we, how do we really make a difference there? And one of the overarching aims of GNI is going to be our ability to speak uh, with credibility uh, as a multi-stakeholder force uh, when we're engaging with international uh, governmental organizations with individual governments to help move uh, the inevitable concerns which governments and international organizations have around uh, the subject of, of regulation and governance of the internet and hopefully we can avoid uh, too, too much of the inevitable consequences in a very fast moving environment uh, of the, the unintended consequences of much legislation. And um, I don't know whether you've all picked up a copy of the, of the latest annual report, the 2012 annual report. We say uh, about ourselves that we're about protecting and advancing freedom of expression and privacy. Um, so I won't go into the argument about whether that is or is not uh, an appropriate use of language and whether it's in line with uh, the, um, the ruggy principles or not. But I, I would just... Um, perhaps turn it around the other way and say, are we actually doing that? And both outside and inside GNI, we ask the question, you know, are we making a difference? Are we, in fact, advancing and, and protecting those two very important principles? And the way I answer it is by looking, first of all, at the micro level, at the level of individual companies. We heard uh, a Bailey from uh, Yahoo uh, talking a minute ago from this chair saying that uh, we needed lots of practical ways, operational ways, of uh, making uh, our commitment under the GNI principles effective. And uh, I think we're already doing that. I was very, very um, impressed by Mike Newman's comment and his, his use of the phrase, uh, we're all caught by the prisoner's dilemma. So someone's got to go first, or if there's not someone who goes first, you've got to have collective action. In other words, you, you get strength through, through working together. And I think, in fact, in that particular case that he cited, by going first, he was then able to get collective action uh, from other members of that particular part of the ICT industry. And we, we tend, and I agree there with, with Leslie's comment about the need to say more publicly about what we're doing. Um, I was very impressed where we were approached by a non uh, GNI member company who said we've just now had these demands in country X and we really don't know how to react to them and literally within hours we had put together a 10-point program for that company how to deal with that particular request. The information, the expertise, the, the experience is there but we need to be better at telling people that we've accumulated that expertise and, and there's real value there. And then at the, at the macro, that's the micro level, how individual companies deal with the problem. And at the macro level, increasingly, as you've heard from a number of the comments uh, made this morning, GNI is increasingly active and is increasingly recognized, not just by um, the US government, who've been absolutely tremendous. And those of you who have heard Hillary Clinton uh, speak on, on uh, the subject of uh, freedom, freedom of the internet uh, and protection of uh, user rights. Um, she's a, a fantastic speaker on these, but she always says, and GNI is at the center of this effort, so please, if you can, uh, speaking to a, um, a company audience, 
uh, please, if you can, think seriously about joining that effort, that initiative to make it even stronger. So I'd like, uh, in concluding, to thank you all very much for coming. Uh, it's been, I think, for um, certainly me watching uh, the progress that we've been making uh, since I've been on board, certainly not the six years that uh, we were talking about uh, with many of you today. Um, and it has been already, just in the one and a half years I've been involved, tremendous progress. Uh, we have a fast-moving environment where we're trying continually anew uh, to implement uh, successfully our uh, principles and to influence both companies and governments and all others to come together to find right solutions uh, to the fast-moving environment that the Internet represents. So thank you all very much. Um, have a um, join us for, for lunch if you're able to stay. Uh, and um, I'd like to thank again, uh, particularly John and all of the speakers for uh, a tremendous uh, morning. Thank you very much.